any one of my clients or I have any issue and I call them for one, I'm not talking to the lowest person on the totem pole. I'm talking to VP level people or owners of the organization. And they know in the back of their mind, that's what I mean with the human nature thing, that this guy represents basically 30 or so of our properties and is consistently bringing new people to buy from us. So if we are no longer on good terms because they change procedures or they don't treat either my properties, my tenants or my clients, there's always this understanding, okay, there is a risk if we don't do it well, if we don't maintain this relationship that this guy could go somewhere else and he wouldn't just take one property, he would take probably the whole portfolio and all his clients and would probably not ever buy something from us again. So I'm not saying that I'm playing on this kind of tune all the time, but it's in the subconscious, right? And we all do it. If we know we have a really highly valued client, we just treat them a little different. Welcome to the Mastering Real Estate Podcast. This podcast is for real estate investors and professionals looking to take their real estate game to the next level. Each week, I review the industry's leading real estate books and break down the main lessons that you can apply to your life and business. Then every other week, I review my own personal lessons learned from flipping over 100 houses and being a full-time real estate investor since 2018. Stay tuned each week so that we can all become masters of real estate together. Welcome back to the Mastering Real Estate Podcast. This is episode 31, and today we are talking to Air Force pilot turned real estate investor and entrepreneur, Axel Meyerhofer. Axel's story is incredible and full of actionable insights, so you do not want to miss this one. I'm your host, Maura McGraw, and I've been a full-time real estate investor since 2018. I've managed over 100 flips, founded and grew a real estate investment firm here in Alabama, and I'm also a licensed real estate agent here in Alabama. And most of all, I live and work in the real estate industry every day. Today, I am honored to introduce our special guest, Axel Meyerhofer. Axel is an accomplished business coach, author, and keynote speaker with expertise in real estate investment, leadership development, and financial freedom strategies. Originally from Germany, Axel's journey has been very diverse, beginning with a successful career as an Air Force officer, and then transitioning into corporate leadership roles, and finally into entrepreneurship and real estate. He's the founder of Ideal Wealth Grower, where he teaches professionals and investors how to achieve financial independence through turnkey real estate investing and personal growth. With a unique blend of analytical insight and actionable guidance, Axel empowers his audience to cultivate a wealth mindset and build passive income through disciplined investment and smart asset management. He's a regular contributor to industry publications and has been featured in numerous podcasts, webinars, sharing his strategies on wealth creation, property investing, and financial literacy. Axel is known for his relatable, down-to-earth style, making complex financial concepts accessible to a wide audience, and his mission is to inspire others to achieve financial freedom so that they can live life on their own terms. Thank you so much, Axel, and welcome to the podcast. Great podcast. I am so happy to have you here this morning. Yeah, I'm happy too, and happy to see you again. So yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yes, I had the joy of being on Axel's podcast last week. It was such a great conversation. So now I'm excited to turn the tables around and ask Axel all the questions. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Let's start. You have such an interesting background story. So I would love to hear a little bit about how you grew up, how you came to the U.S., your military service, and then we'll transition to how you got into business in real estate. Yeah, okay. I try to keep it concise. So I'm originally from Germany, and my uncle was a fascinating character. He was 
responsible, this is 100 years ago, for setting up Lufthansa Cargo because it was only known as an airline and they discovered some people want to ship stuff in planes. Nowadays, it's totally normal, but at the time it was a novel thing. And so he started that in Germany and then got an assignment to do it in Hong Kong. When he came, he was one of those, or is he still around, a very charismatic person. He was smoking a pipe and all kinds of stuff like that. So I was so fascinated. And then he always gave me these little toy planes that you used to get when you were basically on a plane. And he obviously got them because he was an executive in the airline. And so I got totally fascinated with flying and I wanted to fly for Lufthansa. Got out of school, did the testing that you need to do, passed the testing, which is not that common. And then I got a letter from Lufthansa say, congratulations, you passed the testing. But right now in this economic environment, we are not bringing on new people for training. We will let you know when this starts again. And I basically got in touch and said, so what, like six months, nine months, how long do I have to wait? And they said, we don't know. It's like early 80s. It's like recession time. <laughs> I thought, but if you can tell me, what am I supposed to do? And they said, we can't really help you. You can obviously apply to other airlines. You already passed the test and so now you know how it works. I considered that, but at the time there weren't any other really big uh, airlines in Europe. So I was totally devastated until my mom, who was working for the Navy as a civilian secretary, told her boss and he said, why isn't he flying for the Navy? And she came home and said, hey, did you know the Navy is also flying planes? I'm like, okay. So I go to recruiting office and they say, yeah, you can learn to fly here. And uh, first you have to learn how to drive a boat was something to that effect. I don't know really what the, what the proper terminology is. And I said, no, I want to learn to fly. And I said, no, no, we don't do that. First boats, then fly. He said, I'm sorry, but uh, that's not for me. Any ideas what I could do? And the guy literally says to me, I still remember like yesterday, he said, if you're so much into flying, why don't you go to the Air Force? <laughs> so yeah, duh. So I'm going to the Air Force recruiting office and they said, yeah, absolutely. You can apply. And I said, I'm ahead of the game. I already passed the test. He said, yeah, no, what the civilians do doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. yeah. So then I did that testing and it was obviously and admittedly a little easier when you've done it before. It takes, by the way, a week. It's not just taking a written exam or something. You do the physical test and all kinds of exercises and stuff. So simulator flying and what have you. So I passed and got into the training. Um, the training for fighter pilots was in the United States, in Texas and in California. And so well, halfway through my training in Texas, I, my mom calls me and said, hey, by the way, I got a letter from Lufthansa. They invite you now to come to training. And so I was, okay, am I going, am I not going? Ultimately, I stayed with the military and had a 22 year career. And one thing that came out of it is that I went into test flying and a lot of the systems that went into the jets were made by American companies, which meant my wife and I and our little daughter at the time came over and we said, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could be in the US for longer than just a few weeks of training? And I found out there's actually an exchange program. So I applied, I got approved and then uh, switched from flying GR1 tornadoes in Germany to F-111s in the US Air Force. So I did that. And then after that, I was chosen to be a program manager to build a US German air, air training center at Holloman Air Force Base. And with that, I got towards the end of my original commitment because at least in the European system, and I think it's similar in the US Air Force, when you're getting towards 40 or so, most people can't make it through the flight physical anymore. And so that there's like a point where they give you the option to get out or stay basically career officer. And I decided to get out and immediately was recruited into a software company in the Santa Barbara area. and did that for four years and then when I left there and there's a whole separate story about it but when I left there and started my own business in 2005 I realized I need to do something because when you're on your own you don't really have any kind of retirement income expectation and that's what brought me into a, well real estate is something that almost all successful people do maybe I should try to do it too and I initially exclusively did it for myself and for our family but as people can probably tell, even after a few minutes, I'm like a chatterbox and like to talk. And so I kept telling everybody what I was doing when they said, oh, what's going on in your life? I always told them about some real estate deal I was working on. 
And sooner or later, people said, can I do this? Is this something I could do as well? And that's how Idea Wealth Grower started. And I basically began the mentoring program and I've been doing it ever since. Amazing. That is such, such an incredible life story. Can you tell us, or have as you've transitioned from the Air Force to civilian life in a company and now as an entrepreneur, what things that you learned in your military service have helped as you've navigated business and entrepreneurship? I would say one of the big things was that at least in aviation, I, I better how it is in the Marines and in your role that you had. But for me, flying jets is actually really, and I use this terminology to this day, trying your best to achieve mastery. Right, really knowing everything you can know, every little detail about the jet and how it works and how all the systems work and stuff like that. And this yearning for understanding, that is one of the things that stayed with me to this day. And if somebody says, hey, here's a concept and I think it's a great thing for me, my brain immediately said, I really want to fully understand what's going on before in any way committing to it. That's one thing. And then the other part. Towards the end of my career, I was basically introduced into program and project management, and that brings a lot of structure, like thinking in times and tasks and milestones and uh, sequences and stuff. And that's basically what I do for our real estate investing. I basically spreadsheets for everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> and those two things combined, like that, that also led me to say, okay, how can I come up with a model that really serves investors who maybe live in areas that are too expensive, but want to invest to ultimately have the freedom to decide if they really want to continue work or if they want to maybe live off their investments. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Tell us a little bit about how you started out in real estate investing and where you're at in your real estate investing career today. Yeah, we started out in a somewhat of a forced way because we were living in the Santa Barbara area and I had my consulting company and for some strange reason, all my clients were on the East Coast. And so if you wanted to get from Santa Barbara to the East Coast, you had to fly a little half hour hop on a mini tiny plane to LA and then from LA, you could go pretty much everywhere, which was basically my life for the most part. I was flying to Philadelphia or to Baltimore or to Washington DC or stuff. And so ultimately, to come back at the end of the week, it was always pretty much late night, Friday or sometimes Saturday morning. And then I had to leave again Sunday afternoon. And my wife and I, we just realized, yeah, it makes good money, but it's not really alive. What can we do? And one solution that we came up with was to say, can we move somewhere where we still like to live, but where it's not like this much of flying all across the country all the time. So we chose and, and, and selected and looked at and found that Santa Fe, New Mexico, which was also a place we already knew because we were stationed at Holloman Air Force Base, which is about an hour and a half drive from Santa Fe. So we had visited a bunch of times. That would be a location east, but about as far east as we would be willing to go. And we did that and uh, moved there. And that basically got me into real estate investing because at the time the house that we had in Santa Barbara selling it would have been a loss so we decided okay we make it into a rental make it into an investment property and move and as fate had it about three months after moving to santa fe all my clients ended up being in san francisco <laughs> wow how crazy is that <laughs> then we didn't move right away again because we said okay <laughs> It was to fly to San Francisco back and forth from Santa Fe was like 90 minutes or something. So that was much, much better than flying to the East Coast anyway. Yes. Tell me what types of properties and areas, where are you focusing on? What are you excited about in your real estate investing right now? Yeah, the areas change a little bit here and there over the years. Mainly right now, I would say our top focus for myself as well as for our clients is Ohio, because I'm looking at the, all the Midwestern states or all what I call high performing locations for residential real estate investing. But there are others that are pretty good too. But I would say right now, I find Ohio to be the best one before we made investments in Idaho and Illinois and Florida and Tennessee and so it's not that we are stuck with one thing, but over during certain times, certain places just seem to have 
more favorable conditions. And the ratio between how much the properties cost and what kind of rent we can make right now, I would say Ohio is definitely at the top of our list. And as from previous conversation, we use this turnkey approach. And so it's not only that we need to find good properties, but we also need to basically have partners, turnkey partners who provide us with inventory, not just for myself, but for all our clients. Yes, which I think that can be the most challenging, finding a great property manager, finding good contractors, yeah. much easier said than done. Yeah, exactly. And then when you have trusting relationships for years, it gets a little easier. And the other thing that comes with that is I'm always advising our clients to think from an investing perspective in clusters. Right. So I have, for example, an Idaho, Illinois cluster. I have an Ohio cluster. I'm now working on a Florida cluster. And what I mean by that is anywhere like three, four, five, six properties in one area and potentially even under one manager, because that way I always speak about how much effort does it really take to manage your portfolio. And if you think once a month, 30 minutes with property management. So for me, that means I make three calls. I spend 90 minutes and I have a 10 unit. A portfolio right now. So anybody who has less than that might spend anywhere between 30 minutes and an hour a month. You know. I 100% agree with you. If you can find a good team in a good location, that's also what I love to do. Find a great property manager, a great location where your returns are strong. Then that's, I like to double down and, and build a big group there as well. Yeah, there's also one other aspect that comes to to bear basically, and it's a human nature thing in my experience. If you look at, for example, our prime Ohio key provider right now, between myself and our clients, I've probably, or they have sold to us, if you want to, something between 25 and 30 houses. And right? so if any one of my clients or I have any issue and I call them for one, I'm not talking to the lowest person on the totem pole. I'm talking to VP level people or owners of the organization. And they know in the back of their mind, that's what I mean with the human nature thing, that this guy represents basically 30 or so of our properties and is consistently bringing new people to buy from us. So if we are no longer on good terms because they change procedures or they don't treat either my properties, my tenants or my clients, there's always this understanding, okay, there is a risk if we don't do it well, if we don't maintain this relationship that this guy could go somewhere else and he wouldn't just take one property, he would take probably the whole portfolio and all his clients and would probably not ever buy something from us again. So I'm not saying that I'm playing on this kind of tune all the time but it's in the subconscious, right? And we all do it. If we know we have a really highly valued client, we just treat them a little different. Exactly. What I really like about your approach, real estate investing can be passive or it can be very active. And it seems like you've built a really good system to truly make it pretty passive for yourself and for your clients. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate because the thing that I found is and I was the same case at the time. I say, or I call it working with Henry's. And what that means is high earning, not rich yet people, right? Henry's. Cool. So I was at the time when I started really building my consulting business, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time. And the same situation is true for the vast majority of our clients. They have good jobs, but demanding jobs. They're making good money. They would like to get into real estate investing. And if they are like we somewhere on the West Coast or they're in Miami or they're in New York, these relatively expensive places or even other big metropolitan areas, they typically can't really find something well performing, affordable close by. Right. And yeah. so if you see this kind of image of a Henry and you want to serve them, then one of the things they always say is, I like to be the straight out owner having full control about the asset that I'm owning and getting all the advantages that the government gives for the asset owner. But I don't have a whole lot of time to do management or toilets or calls from tenants and stuff like that. And the media plays on this kind of awful uh, thing that every investor seems to have, which is really not true. But when we do our approach using turnkey providers that do find the property, renovate it, 
market and sell it and then manage it for us, then all we really do after the purchase of each property is talk to them half an hour once a month. Amazing. That is, a, that is an amazing approach. How, tell me if someone is hearing this and they are interested, they are, maybe they're a Henry and they're like, this is perfect for me. And they might be interested in working with you. Talk to me a little bit about how that process would work. Yeah, so the first thing I would say, if anybody listens to us right now, would be go to idealwealthgrower.com to our website. And in the top right hand corner, you find a little button that says something like discovery call or book a call or something like that. I think my web guy keeps changing it, so I don't ever really know what it says exactly. But the idea is let's have a complimentary call. And I have it actually said to be a 60 minute call, even though we don't necessarily need 60 minutes, but I really want to get to know the person get to know what your goals are, get to find out, is what we are doing really a good fit for you? And then determine, okay, are you really advanced enough in your thinking and in your experience to more or less only be interested in tapping into the network that we have built for the turnkey providers, insurance providers, lenders, all these different entities that one needs if you really wanna go with the per through the purchases on and building a portfolio or are you somebody who also needs what I call the protective side? And that's what the mentoring program is for, where I am working with you, how to set up your family trust, how do you set up your operations company that all the rents and mortgage payments and stuff go through? How do you make a legal structure so that if anybody ever says, hey, Mora, you did something wrong at this property and I found a lawyer who wants to sue you, that your whole pop a portfolio or your personal belongings are not under threat in any way, financially or legally. So there's more to it because for me, the, there are two big important things that I want to provide as like these milestones. The one thing is if we come together, what is what we call your time freedom number? The amount of money that would have to come out of your portfolio as passive income. So you have the freedom to say, do I really want to keep working what I'm doing right now? Or do I want to work less or maybe not at all anymore because I have this income every month? That's the one big milestone. And then the second big milestone that kind of fits into that same thing is to say, how do I make sure that my family and my belongings are protected and ready to be acting as generational wealth? Where yes, I'm putting it together for myself, my family, but also for my kids and their kids and the future generations. And those things are all part of the mentoring program that are well beyond just the investing itself. That's so cool and so important. It's not just about how to buy your first property. There's a whole bigger picture at play. So I think that is very needed. And that also means we, you need access to lawyers, you need access to CPAs, you need access to people who can do a family trust and do all the paperwork. And so when I mentioned earlier, yes, I have all this kind of investing relationship network, that's true. But then this other second network that basically opens up when somebody joins our mentoring program. Awesome. That is so cool. Tell me, are you, do you have any favorite books, resources, any favorite kind of tools that you are using right now that might be helpful to the other real estate investors out there? Yeah, so I would say for, yeah, I'm coming for books. I like two. for one, there is actually somebody named Chris Closure who wrote a book about the approach that we are practicing. That book is called the turnkey revolution. And then the second book I like, because the guy wrote it, actually, his name is John Soforic. He wrote it for his son to learn about money habits. It's called the wealthy gardener. So those cool. will be the two books that I would recommend. Now, if somebody is a little bit already into real estate investing and you ask me about tools, I really like Rentometer. Yes. Uh, because that is a tool where you can use it for free, but I really recommend to get a pro version, which is like a few dollars a, a month, or you can get an annual one and you can put in any address and is it a three bedroom, one bath, two baths or whatever. And it gives you an analysis of what is a reasonable rent expectation and for what kind of rent have other properties within a half mile or mile around the one that you're looking for been rented recently. Because the situation typically is 
even if you want to tap your little bit into it on your own, you go on Zillow, you look for a location that you're interested in and you find a house. Let's say you find a three bedroom, two bath house for $150,000. If we go by our initial criteria, you would want to know, can it make $1,500 in rent or not? Just as a starting point. So you tap that into Rentometer and if Rentometer says no more than 1200, this one is not a deal for you. Yes. Right? So it, that whole process between finding a property and then checking it out can be very quick. Now, on when somebody joins us, we have many more criteria, many more things. And also we are vetting properties for our clients. So you don't have to look at a million houses on Zillow. We're basically getting all our deals that never show up on Zillow because we have these relationships. But Rentometer is still, I still use it all the time because I want to have a kind of like trust but verify approach that the military is very fa famous for. So if somebody says, or the turnkey provider says, we think we can get 1500 rent, I still put it in and see, have any other houses of the same kind been able to reach that in the last six months or nine months or so. Yes, that is such a good tool, such a good recommendation. I know that you are very busy and so we only have a couple minutes left, but if people want to learn more about you, more about what you're doing, or maybe they're interested in working with you, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, like I said before, ideawealthgrower.com and then find that button on the top right hand corner of the homepage and book a call. And really it's completely complimentary. I just got, I love to get to know people. And if you tell me what you want and what you've been looking at, and I find out what we do is maybe not the right thing or not a perfect fit. I know a lot of people besides Mora that I can refer to that may be better fit for what you're looking for. So I really feel in a holistic sense, I want to take care of you to the extent that I can. If it's something that I do anyway, I take care of you like grandpa or something like that. But if it's something that is more a referral case, then I'm happy to do that too. I think there is so much community within the whole real estate investing um, world, so to speak. I've really, and you're an ex excellent example, Maura. I, I keep uh, get to know wonderful people who really yeah. believe in this whole idea of abundance. And we all have our little slice of an almost infinite pie. And that's why I rarely ever find anybody who says, oh, if I give this client to somebody else, then I'm somehow losing anything or so. So that's the way I am as well. If I find what you guys do is better than what I can offer to somebody, I'm a, I enjoy to hear six, nine, 12 months later that the person found the perfect fit. But obviously, ideally, I want to be the person who provides the, provides the service myself. That's amazing. I totally agree. This community is amazing. and. The 99% of the people in it have good hearts and great mindsets. It's very rewarding. Yeah. One thing I might like to say, if you give me the one last 30 seconds here, for anybody who is vetting, quote unquote, people that they have heard on a podcast, like what you and I are doing here and saying, I'm intrigued. I, I wonder if this would be the right person for me. I really like to recommend that when you have that conversation, like I offer the complimentary conversation for anybody, ask whoever the person on the other side is to show you what they actually have in assets, in programs, in systems, in calculators, and whatever other tools that they use. Because one thing I find that 1% that you spoke about that is maybe not falling into the category uh, that we like, are people who want to sell you some sort of training that ultimately only allows you to do the work yourself with very little support. And sadly, I have to say, sometimes I find that these people never really did an investment. They have no skin in the game. They don't have any portfolio or anything. They're just good at offering helpful training programs. And it doesn't mean the programs are bad. It just means if you really want to get an answer when something weird shows up in your disclosure documents or in a legal document or when the turnkey provider wants you to sign a form or stuff, then you want to have somebody like you and me where we can say, yeah, we have done these dozens of times and that goes here and this is right and this is wrong. So that's, that's really, that's, I think it's important to ask, what of the things that you offer to me have you done yourself? That's really a core question everybody should always ask. Such good advice. 
Axel, it has been so wonderful speaking to you again. I'm so grateful that you took the time to come on the podcast and I can't wait till our paths cross again. Yeah, absolutely. It will be soon. I know that. Yes, <laughs> definitely. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll talk to you soon. Yep. Thank you, Maura. Thanks for having me. No problem. Bye, Axel. Bye. Thank you so much, Axel, for coming to the podcast. What a great interview. Thank you for listening today. This podcast is made possible by Doradus Properties or my real job. Doradus is a real estate investment firm in Alabama. And if you are a real estate professional located in or around the Birmingham, Mobile, or Baldwin County areas, we would love to connect and work with you. Despite the crazy interest rates, the market, the election, everything that's going on, we are still always looking to buy properties and expand our network of business partners and other real estate professionals. So feel free to send me an email at mora at doradusproperties.com, or you can fill out any of the forms on our websites in order to connect with us. Right now, we are actively looking for more properties to add to our rental portfolio and to flip. So if you have anything on your radar, make sure to keep us in mind. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. We are a new and growing podcast, so every rating, review, and share helps immensely. Also, make sure that you're following us on YouTube and social media. You'll get a lot more behind the scenes and content there daily. See you in the next one.